each Sunday. I'm so encouraged uh, by your hospitality. Thank you so much for opening up your doors to our college students who are uh, trying to figure out what it means to live life on mission, even if it means going across the sea uh, to a place that's never heard about the gospel. And we really didn't need power. We really didn't need um, air conditioning. We just need a ping pong table. And you guys had it, and, uh, and Josh opened uh, the doors here for us to be able to have this weekend. We actually canceled it uh, for five hours, and, um, and then lo and behold, here we are. And so we are so uh, eternally thankful for that because we know that God is doing something among these students, and, uh, and I've been able to walk the streets with them and uh, seen them in action, and so it's encouraging to be able to come and uh, to hang out with you here today. I just wanted to start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your generosity. You are a generous church. When this uh, whole week hit, I know many of you had trees in your yard, trees on your houses and cars, but you figured out ways to go and help others and your neighbors and even uh, help them financially as well as we looked across. This church over just the past 20 years has given to the South Carolina Baptist Cooperative Program $11,322,883.20. Just so you'll know, that launches 120 international missionaries on the field for their first year with all of their training. Just that funding um, allows us to plant uh, hundreds of churches in North America. And if you chose to give that direct, you could have done that for that period of time. But because you joined in with this ecosystem that we call the cooperative program among Baptist churches, we've kept them on the field, we've kept funding those church plants, and we've seen missionaries deployed all over the world And so I just want to thank you. I want to thank you because you have done more than just raise the bar in South Carolina. You have set the bar in South Carolina. You are the number one giving church in the cooperative program for South Carolina. And you've told the other churches, y'all catch up. And so for that reason, I am so thankful because in my seat, I actually get to see your dollars at work in the ecosystem, not just in South Carolina, but also in North America and to the ends of the earth. You sacrificially gave away funds that could have been used here. And you have led a global mission force for good that deploys 3,400 fully funded missionaries around the world like Julie. I have been able to walk the streets with them in Egypt, I've been able to see them in the, in, the, in the areas of the subway in Paris, working with refugees. I've looked into their eyes as we've walked the streets in Taiwan and seen ancestral worship in furnaces that would burn fake money in order to get to a God that does not exist. I've been able to see them in Japan, the highest concentration of lostness in the history of the world with 99.7% that are non-believers, and the hopelessness that comes in some of those individuals' eyes. And I've been able to see those international missionaries, and I can tell you that you'll be proud of them. I was in a room this past year in in an area of the world where there was one-third of our missionary force. I was overwhelmed as a thousand of them were in worship together. And I just thought to myself, I wish that everyone could see this room. They matter. But you've also started 11,000 new churches since 2010 through the North American Mission Board, led by individuals like Will and Tara. And, uh, and I've been able to see their work. I've been able to actually pull an individual out of the subway, put them in a church that's a church plan of theirs called Set Free Church, and been able to see them even minister to those who are down and out. And uh, you've got strategic leaders. In fact, Will took me riding around uh, the streets of L.A., and uh, he said, I'm really embarrassed about what's about to happen, and I want to tell you up front I'm sorry. And I said, what is it? He said, my car's running hot, and we're about to break down. (laughs) And I said, that might be the most strategic move you've ever done. 
I said, we'll get you a new car, Will. He's like, no, no, I don't need a new car. I just need a new radiator. And you are a critical part of the mission-sending force in South Carolina. Gethsemane Baptist Church, who hadn't baptized anybody in a decade, was revitalized in Charleston because of you and baptized eight people this past year. Yousef, an Afghan refugee who escaped from the Taliban, found hope in a community of believers in Greenville and heard the gospel from an organization that helps fund that ministry. Half of the public schools in South Carolina now have a church that is serving them and gaining access to an entire people group. 7,016 students heard the gospel at Somersault, Kidsault, Camp McCall. 20,094 college students were engaged by BCM Ministries. 54 college students in Palmetto Collective, 40 of them who sit here today, are preparing to live their life on mission and possibly go full-time overseas. And a recent Palmetto Collective participant that we'll call June led the first known convert in an unreached, unengaged people group that we've ever heard about this past year, and she was from South Carolina. That's big deal. That's big stuff. And in addition to all that, South Carolina disaster relief units were deployed all over South Carolina this week to help cut trees off of houses and help broken hearts along the way, deployed even to the areas of uh, Greenwood and Gaffney and Greenville and Aiken. But in addition to all that, your pastor's a pretty big deal. And, and I know that you brought him here because you wanted Allison to come. <laughs> and that will be our secret. Uh, but he is a good friend, and, uh, and he does... Uh, have a library that's full of books and smells of rich mahogany, and he's read many of them. <laughs> but he not only uh, preaches about missions, he lives it out. And uh, so if you want to learn, if you want to learn how to reach people, if you want to learn how to share your faith, just go hang out with Josh. Just walk around with him because he cares about people. And what I appreciate about my friend is that... Uh, he not only cares about those he doesn't even know in this community, but he cares about those in the world who, who people have given up on. And he's raised his family well, and, and, uh, and he's put together a pretty awesome staff here. And, uh, and they're really the ones doing the work around here. I knew I, I get that. I get that. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. You know who they are, but I'm telling you, they are leaders in our state, and they are leading around this state in other churches. I don't know how y'all get anything done around here because you care so much about people outside the walls. You believe that every life counts. Dylan's life counts. You don't know him. He lives in Greenwood. But he lives right next door to one of our BCM missionaries. And when our leadership team this past Wednesday went to serve our BCM missionary who had five trees hit his house in 20 minutes period of time and came through the roof, and he texted his son and said, you'll find my body in the basement, and I want you to know where I am. When we got there to serve him, that's one of those that you fully fund. He said, I've had enough help this week. I want you to go serve my neighbors. And so Dylan was his neighbor. And he told us, he said, uh, he doesn't go to church anywhere, and I'm not sure where he stands with the Lord, and he hasn't had much openness to talk about Jesus, but I've tried. And uh, you guys are going to go cut a tree off of his driveway because his car is currently stuck and he can't get out. And so um, we went up, and I grabbed a chainsaw. Now, I need to let you know, I may not be as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was, okay? <laughs> All right? And uh, we did have, uh, uh, you know, some men who, who, who shared the same sentiment. And so that first hour, I'm telling you, we did it. Now, the rest of the day was difficult to work through. Um, but I grabbed a chainsaw. We started cutting up this tree and worked a couple of hours. And, and uh, then this old-timer, my, my first cut, I actually got the chainsaw stuck. And um, old-timer with DR taught me a trick or two. After a couple hours, though, I took a break, leaned up against a stump, and started talking to Dylan found out his story, found out where he's from, found out uh, where he worked, found out about his family, and we chatted for a while, and, 
And then I just said, you know, a lot of people your age kind of have doubts about God, especially in difficult times like this. And he said, well, that's not the case with me. And I was surprised to hear that. And I said, oh, really? I said, have you ever placed your faith in Jesus? He said, yes. I said, wow, when? He said, two days ago during that hurricane. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and so we chatted a little more and and, uh, found out that, you know, that he didn't quite understand the gospel. So I just kind of laid out the the gospel to him, and I said, now you're having to turn your life over to Jesus. I mean, he's your boss. Are you cool with that? And uh, he was like, yes. And I said, one of the first acts of obedience is is to be baptized. Is that something that you would want to do? And he paused a moment, and uh, he said, yes, I do. And then I said, well, the Yoda of Christianity lives next door to you. Scott Smith, he's been in ministry for 45 years, been leading uh, Lander University. I said, just go hang out with him once a week and let him talk to you about Jesus, and he'll tell you about his church, and he'll talk to you about what it means to really get baptized and how you do that. This past week is easy. This past week, we see people in need. And, um, and then you've seen the, the, the story of the lives that have been lost in western North Carolina, and it compels you. I don't care if you're a believer or not. There's something inside of us that says we, we can't allow humans to be in disaster. And, and so we go. We, we, we've seen people risk their lives. There were two firefighters that died in my community when a tree fell on top of their fire truck as they were uh, trying to go and save somebody. We've seen individuals lose their lives. But something happens during a disaster. We risk our lives. We change our schedules. We get real intentional about our prayer, and then we empty our pockets, and we give. And we try to figure out how to best do that. Our communities live in a constant state of spiritual disaster. What if we lived every day like people were in the midst of disaster, in a desperate need to be rescued? Gospel urgency is uncomfortable, it takes guts, and it's risky business. And this past year, I had the opportunity to share this passage with your teenagers. I'd love to share it with you in Acts chapter 5. So turn with me there, if you would, to Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. And we see these early disciples urgent about the gospel. Now, when you turn to Acts 5, you'll, you'll see that just before this passage, the apostles are healing the physical needs of others, but in the same process, they're talking about this kingdom of God and the spiritual needs. And it's kind of causing a stir. There's a movement that's beginning to happen, and the religious folks, they, they don't like being out of control, and so they kind of pushed it down. And the high priest rises up in verse 17, and all who are with him, and and the party of the Sadducees that were filled with jealousy, and they arrested the apostles, and they put them in the public prison. The preaching of the gospel landed the apostles in the most uncomfortable of situations, the public prison. Gospel urgency is uncomfortable. It will take you out of your comfort zone. And right now it may seem that that you're in the Bible Belt, that you're in actually one of those states that's conservative when it comes to biblical values, whether you go to church or whether you don't. And and you're even in a part of the state, in a part of the state, where it's really normal sometimes to even talk about uh, God doing things throughout your life. But that's changing. In fact, the fastest growing religion in South Carolina is the non-affiliated with any religion. One million people have moved in here in the last 20 years. They're projecting that another million will move in shortly. And you are about to face extreme opposition. In fact, you'll find that in your lifetime that sin will become more and more normalized. And the more normal sin is, the more abnormal obedience to Jesus will be. And soon, and very soon, for the first time in American history, probably in the generation that will follow you, the majority of Americans will be in the non-affiliated group. And most models that show this say that it will happen by 2070. There's always an asterisk there when you see that, and it says, unless revival breaks out. But if that happens in a land where the majority is the one that chooses 
your leaders and your laws, you will find that it will become very uncomfortable to live like Jesus wants you to live. So normal, respectable people in South Carolina will believe much different than you. And when you speak up about the gospel, you may find that you'll be in uncomfortable conversations. We pray that revival breaks out because of a service like this, where we believe that we could reach people here in South Carolina, and the time is now to do so. Verse 19, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. I don't know about you, but if I'm in prison and I begin to pray, my prayer is usually about my comfort. Lord, get me out of here. It is not, Lord, send me back to the place that brought me here so that I can come back to here. In fact, if I were being released, and I'd probably have a conversation with them. I'd probably have a conversation with the angel to say, no, I think you got your orders incorrect. You see, when we went to the temple courts, we got arrested and came here. So we don't need to go back there. We need to be more strategic. Let's go somewhere else. You need to go back and talk to Jesus about that. But at the end of the day, these apostles didn't, they didn't question. They were so in tune with the Lord that it didn't matter if they were going back into an uncomfortable situation. And they go right back. It's immediate. There's an urgency that comes with them in the morning at daybreak. They don't wait till the, till the, till the afternoon service. They, they go straight in in the morning. And they begin to teach again. God is more interested in rescuing the lost than catering to your comfort. Just everybody relax. I was talking to myself. But isn't that true? We get so interested in catering to our comfort, it it even changes our prayer life. Our prayer life ends up being a a, a prayer recital, organ recital, just to try to get my organs to feel better or, or just for me just to be able to be in comfort. And so we pray things like, Lord, heal me of this ailment or, or, or help me make a good grade on a test that I didn't study for. I know you don't do that, but uh, Lord, please give me a girlfriend, or Lord, please help me get rid of this boyfriend. I mean, there's all kind of prayers that we pray to try to get comfort for ourselves. Lord, give me a good job so I can make a lot of money and live a comfortable life. We want Jesus' stuff more than we want Jesus. The religious leaders show up and realize that these guys are gone, and they can't figure it out. They want to know where they are. And so they go and they bring them back under trial. In verses 21 through 26, they go and retrieve and bring them back. In verse 27, when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Gospel urgency takes guts. When was the last time you stood up for something? When was the last time you were bold about your faith? When was the last time that you you did something that took guts and actually signed up for a mission trip? That was just across the street. Or maybe sign up for a mission trip that actually takes you across the world. When was the last time that you said, I must obey God rather than men? In verse 30, he lays out the gospel. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Jesus was was crucified, buried, and resurrected. He is now leader and savior. He will give you repentance and forgiveness of sin. It's pretty simple. It's not that complicated. The gospel is the good news of the saving death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The gospel is the good news of the saving death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A gospel conversation is a conversation where the gospel's in it. Not just a prayer conversation, not just invite you to church conversation. It is a gospel conversation. The gospel is the good news of the saving death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're bold as they share. I met one of your fully funded missionaries this past, um, about a couple of months ago, and he was an English teacher in, um, in the big country. And now in another Asian country that a U.S. passport won't allow you to get into. He was detained for 385 days because he stood up for the gospel. And he had a smile on his face. And guess what? He was back. Are you bold with the gospel or are you bored with the gospel? Because that's the danger, right? The danger is you come to church all the time, you hear all this stuff all the time. You, go, you've been to, you know what? You've got 20 Reach Sundays under your belt. At the end of the day, it becomes just kind of chatter, spiritual chatter. And if you're not careful, you might forget what it was like before you were saved. You might forget what it was like before God came in and wrecked your life for good. You might forget what it was like to have no hope, and now you've got it. So be bold with it, not bored with it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm afraid that our, our generation is a pretty bored generation. We've got a lot of affluence. We've got a lot of stuff. And, and, we've, got, and we've got Facebook and TikTok. So in our boredom, we can just go to there, and then we won't be bored anymore. In fact, I think the next generation may be bored out of their minds. They've got every, this, this next generation coming up, they're the most affluent generation that we've ever seen. they got everything at their fingertips, e even the ability to communicate around the world. College students spend seven hours and 22 minutes a day on their phones. Now, before you start going to judge them, you need to get your kid and your grandkid to show you how much time you're spending on your, your phone. Because there's a little setting that says usage, and they can show you really quick. Adults are more around the four- and five-hour mark. 42% of college students say that they feel anxious without their phones. 25% say that they feel lonely without their phones. And the number one answer given for why teenagers access their phones, and probably you as well, to pass the time. The top two viewed YouTube videos is Baby Shark. You've seen it. Baby Shark, doo doo. Yep, you know it. And TikTok's this dude named Zach King flying around on a broomstick, which actually is pretty cool. You should watch it. But I just want to ask the question what are we doing? Like, what are we doing, right? Why are we so bored? Why are we not engaged? Four out of people in South Carolina are not engaged with any Christian church. 26.5% of our state is African American, and less than 1% are African American in South Carolina Baptist churches. The foreign-born population has risen from 50,000 people to 250,000 people just in the last decade. And South Carolina is the fastest-growing state in the country. And two billion people on the planet have limited to no access to the gospel. You need to get busy? I'll give you something to do. There's a lot to do. We've got to rearrange our schedules. We've got to be more intentional. And we've got to be able to see our community and our world in spiritual disaster. And it will take guts to make the necessary changes that you need. And for your kids, by the way, if you got little kids right now, okay, it is much easier to give them a phone. Trust me, I got three or four boys. I know it. It'll take guts as you as a parent to actually take some of that away and refocus them towards things that matter. Gospel urgency is uncomfortable. It takes guts. And finally, gospel urgency is risky business. When they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them, it says. And if it weren't for one of the leaders, Gamaliel, they may have put them to death instead. But in verse 40, 
They call the apostles in, and they beat them instead and charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. The apostles would have known that moving back to the temple courts to preach about Jesus would result in this type of punishment, but they were courageous rather than cautious. And one of the culture shapers of the pandemic is an abundance of caution mindset. You felt it. You remember a day when we didn't have that. Many of the teenagers and the students and the college students don't remember a day. There was a time in our country when we took risks. In fact, I'm not sure how we survived childhood, those over the age of 50 in here. My mom never bought me a bike helmet. I never had one. Now a kid looks like the Michelin man. Just trying to go out just to take a ride to the next door neighbor. I mean, we used to play uh, BB gun war. Y'all remember that? You know, with the lever action, not the pump, because the pump would kill you. <laughs> the lever action, that just stung for just a second. And now we have to wear protective eyewear to play Nerf gun war. <laughs> My dad made me drink out of a hose. It was plastic. Y'all remember that? Didn't have no water bottles, didn't have no filter. Definitely didn't have anybody selling you water, water bottles. My dad, by the way, thought that was the biggest racket. He was like, whoever put water from the tap into a bottle and sold it to you for a dollar, that man's a genius. <laughs> My mom let me lick the spoon, knowing full well that there were raw eggs in the cake batter. <laughs> and, um, and now that I think about it, I just wonder if my mom cared about me. <laughs> when I left the yard to go play all day, I never had a cell phone. Mom never knew where I was. Didn't know what time I was coming home. Didn't, I'm not even sure she cared if I came home. <laughs> we had a bunch of boys in my house. I mean, I, I, there were days. And that was just when they were 10 years old. But currently, you're tracking your student on Life 360, and they're sitting right next to you. <laughs> you see, evil has a way of invoking fear, but the church should be on the offensive, not the defensive. Okay? Never before in the history of humanity has the tolerance for risk been so incredibly low. We are in desperate need of risk takers with the gospel. What is the Lord urging you to do that's going to take a little risk, that's going to take a little courage? Maybe it's to accept a call to full-time missions or ministry. That scares you to death. Maybe it's share a gospel with your neighbor or maybe share it one more time. Maybe it's to serve those in disaster or maybe give up something the next couple of weeks in order to give to the movement. Maybe it's today is just to go public that you want Jesus to be your king and you want to do it publicly through the waters of baptism. Joshua 1, 9, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And in verse 41, they left the presence of the council rejoicing, not belly aching, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And watch this in verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. In the temple where the religious folks were and house to house where the lost folks were, they were constantly committed to being in a gathering together and sharing the gospel and scattered together sharing the gospel. They were risk takers. They knew what it would cost them, but they went. You know, in closing, I just wanted to share with you uh, my journey this, this past summer. I, I had the opportunity to go on mission in Europe, and we actually uh, went through Munich and we visited the Dachau concentration camp. Not sure if you've ever been there before, but there was a sign when you walked in that said, Never Again. It was inscribed on a monument there where tens of thousands of political prisoners were tortured and killed, many of them because of what they grew up in, many of them because of their, um, their heritage. The evil that occurred during the Hitler's regime is palpable inside the walls of this camp, culminating 
to the crematorium at the back of the property where the dead were incinerated. As you walk through the gates, there's a plaque on the entrance. And it reads this, In honor of the 20th Armored Division, Liberators, U.S. 7th Army, who participated in the liberation of DeKal Concentration Camp, April 28, 1945. The Liberators. What impacted me most, though, was not inside the camp. It was the drive through the little town of DeKal as I left the camp. You see, this town was full of bustling business, even at the time. Kids were playing in the streets. Churches were filled with nice, respectable people just a mile down the road. These horrific acts were being conducted, and its residents turned a deaf ear to the oppression and the death inside the camp, either out of fear, either out of complacency, And it was occurring right under their noses. The blood of thousands were on the hands, along with the men working for the Nazis inside the walls. When the U.S. Army liberated the camp, they were ordered to tell every civilian in Dakar to personally come to the liberated camp and to file one by one men, women, and children to see what was going on inside the camp. They were forced to go through the gas chamber and the incinerator and the room housing the bodies of the dead to see the results of their complacency, apathy, and fear. And then they were told to go on home. If only I could see the results of my complacency, apathy, and fear at times. If only you could see the results of any apathy, complacency, or fear that you have. If only churches could really see what their uninvolvement in the community and the world are. Maybe it would compel us. Maybe we would see the millions of lives at risk of facing an eternity without gospel urgency. But thank God for First Baptist Church Taylors. You are the liberators. You are the ones with the plaque that's written up in the, in the, in the hallways of churches even around our state to say, watch these guys. They care about the lost. They're generous. Watch these guys. They get out of the walls of this church. They share the gospel with those who are in this community. Watch these individuals. These individuals are willing to be uncomfortable. They're, they're, they're willing to, to take a risk. They're willing to have guts to be bold with the gospel. So I would say to you, if you're not part of this crowd, join the movement and get involved with gospel urgency so that one day, we could see the liberation of the lost live with gospel urgency. Father, we come before you in a time of closing and just ask, Lord, that if there's anyone here today that would say, I, I want to be a part of this movement. I, I don't want to sit around bored with my life. I want hope. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want to lay down everything. And I want to come to know Christ, that even today that they would say, I'm not going to wait another second. But I know, Lord, this room is filled with Christians. Some of them have been struggling with a call to ministry and missions for a long time. Some of them who are college students are either trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life. Lord, I pray that you would even give them an opportunity that you would call them even today to be obedient, to be urgent with the gospel. And Lord, as we worship, that we might be focused in on what you would have us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.